for instance, the regularity that solid bodies don't pass through rock. If we were allowed to suspend such laws as that, who's to say which ones we can suspend? and Who's to say which ones we can't? Let me give you some examples. It has been said, there is a report in St. Paul that Jesus appeared not only himself, St. Paul, though that was last of all, but also before the disciples and also before 500 people. And you might say that that was a hallucination, and the argument that it wasn't a hallucination is something like this, that 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once. But the reason for thinking 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once is because we've never observed it. So given the evidence that we have, we have to drop, thank you, we have to drop one of two uh, general statements that we've observed. One of them is that bodies don't come back to life and solid objects don't pass through rock. The second one, which we could also drop, is that people don't have collective hallucinations. One of these two is false, Okay, if we're allowed to assume some supernatural explanation, let's suppose one of these two might be false, but who's to say which one we're to drop? Maybe there was a supernatural hallucination. So Jesus didn't really come back bodily from the dead. All of these people merely hallucinated that he did. I'm not saying it's likely, not at all. All I'm saying is that we've got no better reason to doubt that hypothesis than we have to doubt the hypothesis that he actually arose bodily from the dead. Both hypotheses go against everything we've experienced, so if we're willing to drop, you know, beliefs about everything we've experienced, it seems to be either one could be dropped. So you've got no better reason to believe in bodily resurrection than in supernatural hallucination. That means I've got one minute left, so I'll just conclude this argument. Exactly the same point apply, could, could apply to one of thousands of supernatural explanations. Maybe Jesus was kidnapped by Satan, who then put something else, somebody else who looked like Jesus in his place, and he was the one who appeared to everyone. That explains the evidence. That's a supernatural explanation. Why is that not to be preferred to the other supernatural explanations we've got? My point is that once you're in the game of dropping statements that we've seen to be confirmed by experience every day, for instance, that solid objects don't pass through rock, you can drop any one that you like. Just in my last 20 seconds, I'll just say one other thing. It seems to me that in all probability, most Christians who believe in the res resurrection do not believe in it because of the empirical evidence. It seems to me that most of them believe in it through faith. I'm not going to say anything against that view today, because as I said at the outset, that's not what I'm going to be, what I'm going to be looking at, nor I believe what Gary is going to be looking at. But if you do believe that, then perhaps, if, if that's Professor Havenmasser's opinion, then perhaps he should come out and say it. Thank you very much. Okay, I thank uh, Dr. Ahmed very much for his speech, and I now call upon Professor Gabby, Gary Habermas to open the case for the proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahmed, and for all who are involved in uh, staging this uh, dialogue or debate tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Let me um, first say a few things that I'm not saying, which will sort of uh, provide some parameters for my case tonight, then I will respond briefly to uh, Dr. Ahmed's uh, questions. And then lastly, I will try to at least begin a case for the resurrection of Jesus. Some things I'm not saying tonight. Number one, I'm not saying faith alone or faith at all determines what facts I believe in. I want to discuss data. Um, in fact, I will say, if the evidence is not true, I'm willing to walk away from it. it I'm not going to say faith's going to keep drawing me back. I'm not going to argue tonight that the Bible tells me so. I will not argue that the Bible is inspired. I will not argue that the Bible is reliable. Nothing I say depends on the Bible being either uh, inspired or reliable. Dr. Ahmed asked me, Am I willing to say that certain things that are apparently taught in Scripture are mistaken or something to that effect? And sure, I have questions about all sorts of things. Seven-day creation, Genesis, I think that's one of the examples he gave. 
yes, I have issues with that. If it turns out not to be true, I don't ha that's not even my position. So I, I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. Uh, there's a universal flood by Noah. I mean, I, I, we can pick different things. But not only do I not have a problem or am I willing to admit issues, because I am, but secondly, nothing I say tonight will depend on inspiration or reliability. In other words, I'm going to make a case based on the vast majority of critical scholars and the vast majority of critical, very critical scholars, which I would define as skeptics, agnostics, or atheists. Thirdly, I will not argue that something is true because scholars say it's true. More about this in a moment. Yes, he made some comments about long end notes and long, and I, I do that a lot. I have some very long end notes with a lot of sources. But I don't think something's true just because scholars say so. As a matter of fact, if, here's, here's my general point. If this is a predominant view among scholars, conservative, moderate, and liberal, and even atheist, then probably there are some reasons why they share this view. So I will talk, talk both about scholarly consensus and real reasons for that consensus. Fourthly, I do not say, although I will start with scholarly consensus, I don't say everybody agrees with my conclusions, obviously. I am not going to argue tonight. I suppose we could be pushed there or moved there in the discussion period or maybe in the Q&A, but I, it's not part of my argument to argue that the resurrection is a miracle tonight, at least not by David Hume's definition. I'm going to argue that a man named Jesus of Nazareth died and that a man named Jesus of Nazareth appeared bodily. I'm not ask, answering or addressing the cause or did God reach down in history or did Satan reach down in history or uh, any of those possibilities. So I'm just asking, was Jesus seen bodily after he was raised? And I think that's consistent with the uh, proposition. I'll come back and say a little bit more about my method in a moment. Now, Dr. Ahmed has uh, three arguments on his sheet, and I'd like to address the first two. We can separate these two out, but I would like to make some general sorts of conclusions about uh, we could take this from a number of different viewpoints. David Hume's critical work, his essay on miracles, what scholars today call antecedent probability. But I would just make a few conclusions up front. What is possible or impossible in history depends a lot on one's presuppositions. For example, we're not discussing tonight, and, and ought not, but I mean we're not discussing tonight whether there's a God in the universe. But I am making the point that whether or not there is a God has a tremendous bearing on whether or not resurrections. If some of his first two cases in particular, or maybe all three arguments, say something like, it doesn't seem to me like resurrections can happen like this, I would say, all right, let's just say there are no natural resurrections in this world. But if there's a God for just, I'm, I'm just talking here about probabilities, not trying to address theism. But to answer his question, let's just say for a moment there's a God, something like the original God, just even on a, let's say, for example, basis. And let's say there's a, there is a God with roughly traditional attributes. For God to raise somebody from the dead would perhaps, arguably, make no more, take more, no more work than to say, rise or appear in the case of creation. I mean, that's possible. If your point is, we don't see these things happen in the natural world, maybe they don't come from the natural world. Now, I'm not arguing that today. I'm just addressing one of his conclusions. He says at the very end, third argument, what about the possibility of an hallucination? His last, very last statement on the sheet. Therefore, a supernatural resurrection is no more likely than a supernatural hallucination. Well, first of all, if he's going to assume He's not saying this, but if he wants to allow a supernatural hallucination, if he wants to say Satan produces, we're talking about a realm that I suppose he's going to be a little bit uneasy with if he's an atheist and there's no supernatural world. But if all this is is something like this, let's say the, the, the objection goes this way. Um, what do you think about 500 people seeing Jesus, to use his example? What do you think about 500 people seeing Jesus? You say, well, I don't think that could be a, a, a miracle, which, again, I'm not going into miracle, but you could say, well, I don't think that happens today, you could say, well, on, on his behalf, you could say, well, you know what? Miracles don't ha uh, happen either. Resurrections don't happen either. Why not a...